firing back, Qatar lashes out at the UAE, saying it had a role in the 9-11 attacks in the US. Abu Dhabi is warning the blockade on Qatar could last for years. So will the war of words hamper efforts to resolve the Gulf crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. Weeks have passed since Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and other Arab countries cut diplomatic ties with Qatar and imposed a travel blockade. But their grievances are still largely unknown. There's been little more than rumours and whispers so far, with the old alliances in jeopardy. Qatar has turned to other countries in the region for support. And President Donald Trump has said one thing, while US diplomats and the State Department are saying another. A spokeswoman says the prolonged situation is becoming increasingly confusing. Now that it's been more than two weeks since the embargo started, we are mystified that the Gulf states have not released to the public, nor to the Qataris, the details about the claims that they are making toward Qatar. The more the time goes by, the more doubt is raised about the actions taken by Saudi Arabia and the UAE. At this point, we are left with one simple question. Were the actions really about their concerns regarding Qatar's alleged support for terrorism, or were they about the long-simmering grievances between and among the GCC countries? Well, as the situation seems to be stagnant, there's been a steady flow of harsh words between the countries involved. The Qatari ambassador to the United States wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal this week, responding to the UAE's assertion that Qatar supports terrorism. He hopes people remember, and we quote, the UAE was singled out in the 9-11 Commission's report for its role in laundering money to terrorists, and that Emiratis, not Qataris, were among the hijackers who flew planes into the Twin Towers. The UAE Minister of Foreign Affairs warns Qatar that the blockade could drag on. Anwar Garash said, Qatar will realise this is a new state of affairs and that isolation can last years. If they want to be isolated because of what their perverted view of what their political role is, then let them be isolated. Well, let's get our thoughts from our guests. Here in Doha is Dr Khalid al Khatta fellow researcher at Cambridge University. In Washington, D.C., Hilary Mann Leverett, a former White House official. And also in Doha, Shafiq Gabra, professor of political science at Kuwait University. Welcome to all of my guests. Shafiq Gabra in our Doha studio. To make those sorts of accusations in a major American newspaper can backfire, can't it? How do you assess the way the Qatari ambassador has phrased uh, his comments about the UAE and their connection to the September the 11th attacks? That's very complicated. Uh, to my understanding, definitely Qatar will have to do a lot to explain and to defend itself. Uh, but to, uh, to state that there was any uh, formal uh, Arab uh, participation in September 11 will be an overreach, from my opinion. To my mm -hmm. uh, knowledge, from what I've seen, uh, uh, no one in the Arab system uh, can be uh, seriously involved in this. This was a Qaeda operation, and it wanted to affect the US and to damage its relations with a, a group of regimes on top of them is Saudi Arabia. And that's how I read September 11th. OK. Hey, Hilary Mann Leverett, let's bring you in here. Uh, the history of September the 11th, we all know. Whether you're Al-Qaeda or not, you still have a nationality and a passport somewhere along the line. Some, most of those were Saudis, some were Emiratis. Is it a dangerous game the Qatari ambassador is playing with when trying to win hearts and minds in the US? It may be dangerous, but it is absolutely imperative, critically necessary that Qatari officials make arguments as nasty as they may seem to be to the U.S. Congress and to broader U.S. public opinion here. That is because both the Saudis and the Emiratis have worked very, very hard, especially in Congress 
to convince congressmen that Qatar is this a major state sponsor of terrorism, so much so that they are pushing through legislation that would effectively designate Qatar as a state sponsor of terrorism, which would make ties between Doha and Washington extremely strained, could even lead to um, the Pentagon being forced to move its base out of Elodeid, perhaps to the Emirates, which the Emirati ambassador here has been advocating. So there is a tremendous amount at stake. And even though it, uh, there is danger in the rhetoric and the debate taking on a, a nasty tone, it has really come to that. It is a, almost a zero-sum game. If the Qataris don't push back hard, against what the Emiratis and Saudis are doing here with the U.S. Congress and among the various think tanks in Washington, they risk losing a lot. Of course, uh, Shafiq Gabra in Doha, you're nodding in agreement. Of course, you have a general sense of, of how Gulf Arab and Arab nations are reacting to this. Some have stayed silent. They are watching. What's your general sense of the situation so far when it comes to the political dynamics of the region? Well, first, let me assert that I do understand that Qatar has to push back. Uh, at the same time, we have to push back. Everybody has to push back, but within, within the, the objectivity uh, possible in, in a context that is uh, problematic altogether. Uh, definitely Qatar is not involved in terrorism, and the attack on it in Washington uh, should be fully defended. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I do see that September 11 had to do more with the Qaeda and the grassroots uh, terrorist group that has a history in its mm. relation to the U.S. and how that all came to okay. express itself in the way it did. Indeed. Now, to, to explain the region, if that question still stands yes. or if there is time for it, I will. It's a, it's a very complicated dynamic, as we see. Uh, Qatar is suffering from a blockade, a, a, a state of sanction, a state of boycott. But I, I see that the, the first days were the, the, really the shock. And I think that Qatar was able to absorb that shock. It is much more stable, as I see it today, in terms of dealing with this and ability to find new strategic routes for commerce, for food, dealing with Iran, dealing with Iraq, dealing with Turkey, bringing a Turkish base, realigning its relationship again in a, uh, with the U.S., uh, confirming the base, joint uh, exercises. So Qatar has absorbed it. It's, uh, it's doing a, a, a calm and solid job in defending its strategic position vis-a-vis -vis this kind of boycott that okay. was very sudden and unexpected. Right. Let's, let's bring in uh, Dr. Khaled al Qatar here in, in Doha. I think you would agree with what uh, most of what Shafiq Gabra has said, uh, that Qatar has found a new way to deal with the outside world economically, regardless of the imposition of an embargo. How are you assessing the situation as an economist? Uh, you want me to assess the strength of the Qatari economy to withstand this uh, blockade? Okay, the Qatari economy uh, derives its strength from two sources. First, the vast natural resources we stored in this country, and then the economic sound economic policy adopted by the government over the boom years to utilize these resources and uh, the macro stabilization policy to, to stabilize the economy. Uh, Qatar invested heavily in uh, infrastructure, uh, to extract and export natural gas to the world and from the third largest reserve in the world and became the largest exporter and uh, uh, producer and exporter of natural gas how in the world. It? And that provides a sustainable source of how income. How do you see it dealing right now? How do you dealing see it adapting right, I, to I, what's I, happening? I think Qatar is adapting very well and dealing very well. First of all, I just be honest. I th uh, after half a century, about half a century of exporting oil, uh, we failed in the GCC to uh, diversify our economy, and so basically we have one product and we export, which is oil, and we import almost everything else we need from consumption good to uh, capital good to uh, uh, labor from overseas. So there is not much to exchange between us and the intra-trade between the GCC country relative to the world remain stagnant at 10% 
over decades now. So there is not much to pressure on Qatar through the trade sanction and Qatar can easily uh, outsource, uh, easily find alternative source of import. Uh, and they lose the Qatari market, plus they lose ethically. So, so far, Qatar um, uh, diver is diversifying its mean and sources of import from uh, other country. In and short, do you think it can weather the storm? It yes, can weather yes, sanctions? yes, very well. We Perhaps. import 4% from Saudi Arabia. This is not like Germany with its uh, neighboring smaller state, which export about 60% per, uh, of their needs. So you can really hurt them. Uh, so basically, we, uh, Qatar, uh, have the first line of import, uh, uh, as I call it, uh, extending from uh, Turkey to Iran to Pakistan to uh, India and Oman. Uh, it has giant infrastructure uh, facility to import seaport and uh, world-class airport. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Let's just bring in uh, Hillary uh, Mann-Leverett here just for a second, because obviously the public discourse runs on two channels, Hillary. It's the public um, arguments that are happening internationally between uh, the interested parties, and you've got the economic blockade, which is also raising fears, not just amongst those that it affects, but also uh, various continents, including Europe and obviously North America. How is this discourse? This discourse obviously has now hit a hit a mark with the State Department coming out with this statement that they are still very confused about the situation. I wonder how many other nations are confused about it as well. <laughs> yeah, I think many, many are confused. But I think here in Washington, the, the, the critical piece of this is that I think particularly from within the Trump White House, there had been a sense with the summit in May, the Arab Islamic American summit in Riyadh in May, that Saudi Arabia was, in a sense, from the Trump perspective, the winning country with the winning strategy. It was this large country with a dynamic, potentially dynamic new leadership with its Vision 2030. It was everything that Trump could want in a strong leader to, re to help reassert American power and influence in the region. But what Qatar has done has been critically important in shaping the discourse, which may seem confusing, but is really important. They've actually shown the Saudi strategy as a losing strategy, which in the Trump discourse, the Trump Trumpian White House and Trumpian Washington discourse, to be a loser is a real problem uh, now in Washington. And so what the Qataris have done by the most important thing is having the Turkish troops come to Qatar. That was almost checkmate in terms of, you know, if we use the chess uh, game uh, analogy. Having Turkish troops come was something I think the Saudis did not anticipate. I think the Pentagon here didn't even anticipate it here in Washington. Mm -hmm. And it was a clearly winning strategy. That coupled with the Qatari's ability to very quickly, almost seamlessly keep its economy, not just afloat, but doing well, having imports come from Turkey, from Iran, having an infusion, uh, infusing mm. the banks with enough dollars to keep them going. This is a winning strategy. So in Washington, the perception now is, well, you know, Qatar, Qatar may have been seen as a bit of a backwater. It's relatively young. Amir was untested. But he has so far now withstood the test and come out looking like he's winning. And so you see the rhetoric now shifting in Washington in what may be a confusing way, yeah. but I think is one where the Trump White House even is coming around to Tillerson's view that we shouldn't be taking sides and we shouldn't be supporting a side that is looking for uh, potentially even regime change in Qatar, which was just the talk here a week ago. Sure. Shafiq Gabra in Doha, let's come back to you, because the Qataris have been on a major charm offensive. We've seen the foreign minister travelling to European capitals in a very short space of time. We're also hearing in the last 24 hours, the Emir of Qatar has sent a handwritten letter to Vladimir Putin in Russia explaining the situation so far. They certainly are able, it seems, the Qataris to get their message across. One wonders again how the U UAE and Saudi are going to counter this? It's going to be hard to counter for a simple reason, because you have a situation where there is a boycott, sanctions and, and siege. And uh, you have a situation where there is a much bigger uh, uh, country, uh, a group of countries, much bigger, uh, dealing, boycotting, sanctioning a very small country. Uh, in size, cutting it totally in land. 
Uh, so this country is, is resisting uh, through peaceful means uh, and seeking to establish its uh, independence, its uh, ability to set its own agenda and policy uh, within reason. And uh, I think the world will, uh, will sympathize with this, uh, mm. particularly that these sanctions and boycotts and siege is not internationally sanctioned. It, it doesn't come from the UN. It doesn't come from any, uh, anybody uh, on the uh, world from, level. It's, it's very localized. And, the, uh, except from two uh, major players in the GCC, uh, Dr. Khaled uh, uh, al Qatar, let's, let's talk about these sanctions. I mean, what are the implications of the trade sanctions in the short term and the long term? Uh, over the short term, as we can see there, uh, because of it was sudden, so uh, the little import that we import, the share of import from UAE is about 9% and mostly re-export through Dubai Jabal Ali, and this can be rerouted through other, uh, already through Oman, and uh, from Saudi Arabia is about 4%, and from uh, Bahrain is 1%, and as I said, this is not like Germany, 60%. Mm -hmm. uh, and mostly uh, food item, and construction material, and chain supply, and this can be easily uh, supplied from uh, other neighboring country like Turkey already, uh, Iran, and India, and uh, Pakistan, and then you have countries in Europe and country in Asia and country uh, and, and Australia. And then you have the rest of the world. This is over the short term. However, over the long term, we say what we have been saying for many years as an economist to the GCC country, that we have to diversify our production structure mm -hmm. in, uh, with the objective to achieve sustainable growth and development. And this time I want to emphasize clearly and loudly food security and water security in order not to jeopardize our uh, food security mm -hmm. or economic security or uh, political, uh, sovereign political decision. So uh, we fact, have seems, to... In we fact, ha it seems that Qatar is learning, learning a, 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 a very large... I, I believe that Qatar will come out of this crisis stronger than before, mm -hmm. more self-dependent, and uh, we have to listen to the local producer, whether in agriculture or in... Uh, uh, manufacturing, we have to uh, address their concern, we have to uh, support them, uh, give them the right incentive to uh, enhance production, uh, address the uh, monopolistic mm -hmm. structure in the economy, promote competitiveness, employ technology and innovation to deal with the uh, harsh environment. Uh, Lots of lessons you, to be You learned. have to uh, re uh, redirect manufacturing policy toward addressing shortage and need in uh, construction sector. Uh, and a lot to think about there. Yes. Let's just get, let's just take a little pause there uh, because before I come back to Hillary, um, I want to just bring in this that the hacking, of course, you see, of the Qatar news agency is what started all of this about a month ago and is one factor that's contributed to the crisis. Now, Qatar's attorney general has blamed neighbouring Arab countries. Here's what he had to say earlier. The most important thing is that we now have evidence that we identify certain numbers originating from countries laying siege to Qatar, were used in the hack. Some of the phones used were iPhones. We were able to track these numbers down after they hacked the websites. They managed to hack the state news agency and then published false news, blatant lies that they attributed to the Emir of Qatar. They also hacked a number of social media accounts, like the Twitter feed of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they posted fake news as well, all a product of the hack. We still need to correspond with these countries in order to determine the identity of these individuals. The Qatari Attorney General, uh, Hilary Manleverick, let come to you, uh, because we need to come back to this statement from, again, the, the State Department being mystified by the position that Saudi Arabia and the UAE have taken. And apparently the White House and the State Department were on board with this statement, but then you still have an unpredictable president who loves Twitter and, of course, will right. take on board statements from the Qatari uh, Attorney General or the US Qatari ambassador. Uh, so you're never quite sure what's going to happen next. How much of a concern is that to diplomats or to, to civil servants uh, in the State Department, would you say? 
Well, it, it is very much of concern. We had a similar situation on June 9th when Secretary of State Tillerson read a fully prepared and approved statement to the press. He actually called producers into, I mean, reporters into the State Department to read his prepared statement calling on the Saudis and the Emiratis to ease the blockade at that time when just a couple of hours later, President Trump almost completely contradicted him in the Rose Garden at the White House. So it certainly is of concern to diplomats. But I think, again, from the kind of Trumpian perspective within the White House, this is part of the strategy to keep the people that work for him on their toes, working harder, constantly trying to get a better deal, as he as he puts it. So we may see a, some pushback from President Trump, some more support for the Saudi and Emirati position. But I think that's intended to get the get all parties, the Qataris, the Emiratis, and the Saudis, to give something more to the United States. And it could be as crass as giving more money, as we saw the Qatari defense minister here during this uh, during this period sign a deal for $12 billion worth of F-16s. That's exactly what the Trump White House is looking for. But, you know, in addition to this, I do want to, to that, I do want to share my, uh, my colleagues' perspective here that it is beyond having that kind of strategy in Washington where, in a sense, you buy off, appease the, the Trump administration for now, mm -hmm. it is critically important to diversify not just food and, and economic issues, but strategically. The play with Turkey was absolutely essential to turning the situation around for Qatar, and that's going to be critical going forward for Qatar to diversify its relations, uh, not just with the United States and Russia, but with Turkey and others. And did, as you say, in going forward, let's go back to Shafiq Gabra, because in going forward, there is still all of this discussion about mediation. And one wonders now what the position of Kuwait is or the US because while Qatar is on this charm offensive and getting its point across who takes that lead in the mediation to try and solve this Kuwait or the US how are you reading the situation so yes I mean while Qatar is trying to talk there is a lot of diplomacy going on and Kuwait is definitely from the first day or two part of this diplomacy what this diplomacy does from the Kuwaiti perspective as well as all other perspectives, it kind of keeps the situation uh, as calm as possible, keeps the emotions within uh, a certain uh, reasonable uh, dosage. Uh, uh, it can uh, help over time solve the issue, uh, but we don't know how. It's, uh, and therefore the diplomacy continues, which is positive, mm -hmm. as long as people are talking, it's positive. But at the same time, uh, some of those sanctions, some of those uh, uh, policies of siege will uh, fall uh, out of their own weight, uh, or out of their own lack of uh, legitimacy as well as uh, uh, clear thinking on uh, how they were conducted and what they are exactly intended to do. And as explained, everything done uh, with Qatar produced uh, the other result, produced uh, the ultimate uh, negative result from the point of view of those who uh, uh, created that siege. Uh, Qatar is more independent today, uh, more diversified on the security level and on other levels. Okay. But the Kuwaiti, the Kuwaiti uh, approach to mediating comes out of Kuwait's own experience. Sure. When conflicts at that level take place, they do leave damage for everybody. And there is this attempt to get over this. And there was a great deal of damage. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just, we're coming to the end of the programme. I just want to try and get uh, Dr Khaled al uh, Qatar here to also sort of come in on the whole issue of, you know, we're talking about sanctions and the diplomacy that's going on and the damage that's being caused. But there's a damage to the GCC, isn't there, as well? And it, this is an area that wanted to, at one stage, have a unified currency. Yes. The damage is very, uh, the rift is very deep. And the future of the, uh, if you want to ask me about the future of the GCC, I would say, what is the future of this country? Definitely, it's not a bright mm -hmm. due to lack of vision, uh, leadership lack of vision in this country. It, within the, the GCC? Within the, I mean the GCC. Yeah. I mean, it seems to be that these dictatorships are resisting any change, resisting any uh, political reform, the slightest mm -hmm. political and economic reform, and uh, we'll they, are taking, it, they are taking it forward. Yeah. And the whole issue is they want to, to shut up. Mm -hmm. I mean, not you personally. No. They want Al Jazeera <laughs> to shut up uh, after reinstating the uh, dictatorship. 
Uh, Indeed. Let's hope they don't get to Al Jazeera to shut up. <laughs> in, other, in the Arab Spring country and uh, the devastating, uh, 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 the devastating uh, uh, tragic uh, uh, situation in Syria and in Yemen and Iraq, this is, it seems to be that Qatar and Al Jazeera are the only voice now that speaks uh, the ambition of Arab country for dignity, uh, for justice and for political and economic reform. And this is really annoying uh, to them and they are very nervous about this. Well, we shall see what certainly happens to the GCC and, and maybe the future of Al Jazeera too. But uh, I think, Hillary, you are nodding in agreement that we will hopefully stay on air for a long time, as were Shafiq Gabra. To all of my guests, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. And of course, you can watch the programme again by uh, logging onto our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join our conversation, I hope you do, on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From Misa Hill Rahman and all of the Inside Story team, thanks very much for your time and your company. Bye-bye.